The following message by Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark is brought to you by Full Stature Ministries and its supporters. For more information about Full Stature Ministries, please visit forgive123.com. That's forgive123.com. Last week, uh, Jason uh, shared a teaching on the transforming power of grace and his testimony, and I strongly, there's a lot of teaching in a testimony, and besides, a testimony is the kind of preaching we should have and teaching to where there's substance to it. You know, a testimony is not just somebody's information, it's somebody's life, and therefore, that's the success of like Women's Aglow, Full Gospel Businessmen. The success of those ministries was because what people were sharing wasn't somebody secondhand information. They were sharing the substance and the transformation that came from their own life, and that carries a strong anointing. Well, I believe that, that uh, Jason's uh, CD, you can get it in DVD or CD, uh, is really hitting on the topic of the fact that real grace transforms. Real grace is not some kind of uh, pat on the back so you can do whatever you want. That's lawlessness and license. But basically that real grace is the power to obey the word and real grace has the ability to transform lives, change lives. And he has this, but then Jennifer did a series a long time ago on grace. And the interesting thing was that somehow the DVD, the CD, it all got damaged and didn't, uh, um, didn't work. <laughs> That's my son, too. It's a, those preacher's kids, they misbehave. And... and, and Somebody called and wanted me to hold it up so that they could see. This is Jason's teaching on grace transforms. But I believe God really for such a time as this. Jennifer had done a beautiful series on grace and then it got all corrupted and it didn't work. But we, she still has the workbook and it tied in beautifully with Jason's. However, you can buy the workbook booklet uh, by itself. Uh, but if you buy the CD or the DVD, it's... a slightly smaller version is on the inside already. So I really recommend this for people. Plus, testimonies have a way of cutting through people's theology and ministering to the heart, and that's, that's very good. So, there. Very proud of him. Very proud of all our pastors. Now look around, you see how few people there are right now? We've got nine quality pastors in this church. Maybe more coming. You pastor before. Others have pastored before. We, we are drawing leaders because it's going to be... Uh, when I was a very young pastor, I had a half a dozen peers who were very seasoned, internationally connected, well-connected, and they used to tease me, but God never... I never changed what they teased. They all, when we would get in pastors meetings, say, Dennis... The only trouble with your pastoring is you've got all Indians and no, you've got all chiefs and no Indians. And I'm going, I don't care. That's the way God told me to do it. And in reality, everybody is a leader based on your own particular gifting. Because there's the marketplace, which was years ago, they didn't even think in terms of marketplace and the value of marketplace ministry for believers. The kingdom of God is, it covers all of that. There shouldn't be no separation in reality, but... Uh, there's, God was basically saying uh, that he was going to raise up leaders. And the ministry, when we traveled, was full stature ministries, meaning that we're going to uh, implement a system that will press you on to maturity. Because many people have escaped maturity, not because they wanted to, but have accidentally escaped maturity because... They were biblically literate and kept digging into the Word and got more and more informed, more and more informed, but there wasn't enough know-how as to how do I take that knowledge and apply it to life? What is the application? I believe we're entering a season where five-fold ministers are going to move more in the wisdom of God, wisdom and revelation, not just in revelation knowledge, but revelation wisdom 
for application. Um, it's, God's going to give strategy and tactics. I think that's what Joe called me. Joe called me a tactician. He says, you're a tactician. That's different than how-tos, but we use the term how-tos, all right? So I want to cover what I believe God is going to be doing in, the, in, the, in 2015 today. So this is kind of a State of the Union address. But I believe he's going to go more intense. And when I say intense, you don't get much more intense than my wife, Jennifer. And it will be intense because she'll make it that way. We are going into an intense season of mentoring mentoring for 2015 is going to be the key and it's going to be uh, using a combination of things but it's going to be very very difficult say that word back to me very very difficult All right because what we've run into in the church is hungry people get mistaken for being mentorable a hungry person is not necessarily mentorable because it's a one-way relationship it's gimme 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 that's just an entitlement mentality that's out there what we want to do is say, in the mentoring process, I understand that there has to be a mothering element to where they feel safe and secure and trust. You need that environment first. But then the fatherly anointing is going to unpack your potential. That's why in school, whether you have a male or female teacher, they give you what? Tests and quiz. Who goes, oh, I can't wait to go to school and get a test or a quiz. But in reality, that's life. And it will unpack your potential to see how much you are really absorbing and how much are you assimilating in order to actually apply to life, right? So uh, I think the church has mothered too much and fathered too little. And though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many what? Fathers. You know, mentoring even in, in the old concept. Uh, how many know that Miles Monroe uh, died in a plane crash? Anybody know that? Anybody know Miles Monroe? Okay. Anyway, uh, he's from the Bahamas, had a tremendous ministry. But uh, he died, but I know of some of the things that he said before he died that were extremely powerful, and they impacted my life. And I believe we're entering into uh, 2015. It's going to be a year, and we're going to start before 2015. We're going to start pretty quick here. But we've got so many irons in the fire and so few people that we have to accomplish a lot with very little. <laughs> course you could all give and tithe double and then we would resolve half the problem um i didn't hear one amen on that. I, does anybody have multiple personalities because we'll get them all to tithe and you get healed up right away all right but here's one of the thing the greatest act of leadership and by the way when i look back on it as seasoned and as much as i respected all my peers in those early years I'm glad God had me go against the grain a little bit and always look to pull the leadership out of people. Pull the gold. Pull the gold on them because they're going to be leaders in some part of their life. And going into all the world, make disciples, that meant you were going to take a leadership role. You were going to take a leadership role at some level in your home, in business, or in the church. Now, the greatest act of leadership is what happens in your absence. The greatest act of leadership is what happens when you're not there. Now, when I used to go uh, in my first pastorate, when I wasn't there, there, sometimes you would see whoever wanted to be in charge suddenly emerge in the midst. But, like, I've waited for this time, he's gone, you know. <laughs> but in reality, it's if everything that you have done, if it dies with you, you're a failure. And that's, that's really penetrating these days because at my age, I'm at the age, anybody 60 years and older, really they should be mentoring. They shouldn't be a young man who's going to show you what they can do. They should be having more delight in the children doing it and seeing it reproduced than being seen and heard. And so I think true leaders are going to invest in people, not buildings. Do you believe that? Not that it's wrong to have a building. I built my first building as a, a, a dome sanctuary at the instruction of the Lord. But I knew that that was to house people. But the primary is always not to build buildings, but to build people. God's building a building. It's a habitation of God in the spirit, and they're living stones. That's where the emphasis needs to be. And uh, true leaders invest in those kind of, that kind of building. Wise master builders. 
fivefold ministry. Jesus never built a religious building, but he invested in people. Do you realize that? Jesus' ministry, he never built a building. However, under the, under the uh, submitting unto an earthly father, he did. He was a tecton. Tecton was a uh, wise master builder in the natural. We know him as the little carpenter boy, but that's not, that's not accurate historically. Uh, he was uh, in the building trade in that family. And if you'd ever, instead of looking at movies for your identification of what the houses looked like at that time, you'd be better off looking at a history book for what the houses in that time. The architecture was, uh, you know, uh, marble, brick, you know, this, it was not little, little grass huts uh, of any kind. But I believe that what God is doing for 2015 is he's going he's gonna to have us basically train and commission people. And just as Paul was a wise master builder, you know, he told us about Timothy. Timothy said, I have no one who is like-minded for all seek their own. And that would include what's in it for me. When we look at the titles of our books, you know, the marketers that pick the titles for the books, underlying there has to be what's in it for me. They have to appeal to the lowest base nature to sell something. You deserve a break today. You need to get away. That person didn't even know me, but they know that that works, right? But God is basically saying that even Jesus had to be trained by his earthly father and approved by his earthly father before he was commissioned by his heavenly father, that this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When he said he was well pleased, it was because of his lifestyle prior to releasing him for ministry. He not only loved him because he loved him, but he loved him because he, he was obedient. Obedient even in that structure that God had placed him with. And he went from building that kind of stuff to building lives. And quite frankly, there's also a little thing here so we don't get too worried. We're believing to create a habitation of God in the Spirit for an outpouring of the Spirit because if Jesus was the best mentor, this, this also relieves some of the pressure on me, if Jesus was the best mentor that ever lived, hmm? I mean, he was, so, he was such a good protege that he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If he was the best that ever lived, when I look at those 12 disciples without Pentecost, he gives me hope. <laughs> it gave me hope for the church people. It's like warts and all, it's doable because my confidence is in the efficacy of the Holy Spirit, not these people. If you start looking at the people, you go, look, I bet you Peter was a piece of work. I'll bet you... <laughs> I know those that study temperament say Peter was a D temperament, you know, probably decisive, quick. One minute, well, flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you, Peter, but my Father in heaven. Wow. Did you hear that, guys? I am, I received a revelation. I think we should build three tabernacles. Get behind me, Satan. I mean, this guy was, the, was probably one of the first uh, bipolar disorders in the discipleship family. He had high highs and low lows, right? But after the day of Pentecost, after that infusion with power from on high, huh, it was a different story. Then Peter stood up and became all that he called you to be. I believe that full stature is to, is to do intentional sanctification to make ready a people prepared for an outpouring so that they don't fall apart and get goofy either. Hmm? Don't tell me that, that all that training that Jesus gave them that didn't make sense, that the Holy Spirit didn't quicken and bring to their remembrance, and then they had the application to be strong leaders and help those other people that were getting blown away by the Spirit and didn't know what to do with it. That's an element that's always there. We've got to have mothers and fathers raising babies, not babies raising babies. And I, I just don't... Uh, though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. You know those instructors is in the Greek, that word is boy leaders. The Greeks had a style that once you mastered the material, you could be a teacher. You could be an 18-year-old teacher because you mastered the material. But you lack the life experience. Don't tell me you're a father. You don't have enough life experience to know, uh, to answer some of the more difficult questions, no matter how book smart you are. 
So I'm seeing that what Jesus is basically saying that for 2015 is that because there's no success for me without a successor. If there's no successor, it's failure. And I want to reproduce reproducers from as long as I can remember. 38 years of ministry and that's never left, so I'm assuming that must be God or I'm off target. But it's basically never left. Reproduce reproducers. Make chiefs, not just Indians. I'm not interested in people just serving, although they must learn that or you'll never be a good leader. I'm interested in them actually taking something away and reproducing it and multiplying it in their lives. Um, we have a, a, a good relationship with Morningstar and, and uh, um, Sid Roth uh, Ministries for uh, God just basically said, uh, I want you to have that kind of a relationship with them. But what's interesting is that we look around, we don't have very many children, but yet we've done our course from kindergarten through their high school. Every one of them has learned basically this. As long as you don't care who gets the credit, you reproduce according to kind, and there are children there that are actually functioning better in the spirit than adults as a result. And we're going to be on Sid Roth in January, and we're going to do a children's program, and we're going to do some children that have never been exposed to our teaching, our children's books I'm referring to, and we're going to, I think it's the 13th, but it's subject to change. Uh, and and that's, the, that's not the date that it airs. That's the date we're actually there. Um, and to see those children rising up in the testimonies that are coming from people. So the family, and this is not only not only Morningstar, this is around the world. We're, he we're hearing people that have trained people with the children's books. Some adults probably ought to look at the children's books. You, because it's subjective. If it's subjective and they can learn it, maybe that's the quickest way to learn it, by the way. But nevertheless, uh, when that happens, there's going to be an equipping and a reproducing from a little group of people. But I want this little group of people, I want chiefs. We don't need a lot of Indians. You should only be an Indian while you're in the, in the, in the getting healed up mode. Right? Because what God is creating in this atmosphere is a healthy atmosphere that will create a corporate environment. And in that environment, it's like a greenhouse effect. It will accelerate the individual healing that you and God are doing on your own. One of the most beautiful things that we've seen when people have come out of extremely difficult, abusive situations, when they came out, when they're surrounded by a half a dozen of healthy people, it accelerates their, their growth. And you are a healthy people. If you want church as usual on Sunday, you will go somewhere else. This, I think, is, we'd be a hard church to attend, to be honest, because it's very demanding in the area of self-governance. You know, I have, we have people that will come one time so they can get an appointment. I know that trick. That doesn't work. That's a one-way relationship. You know what I mean? And I know there's a lot of needy people. But at the same time, I would rather train these people who are committed to deal, be the patient themselves than be the doctor and go help a multitude. That's better than me. And what I've learned over 40 years in private isn't doing the world any good unless we can reproduce it and replicate it. So I am not dismissing anybody when they ask me for ministry. What I'm saying is, is that I've got people already trained. Why reinvent the wheel? when they need the opportunities. We're gonna be doing mentoring in 2015 where we're gonna do troubleshooting. But like I said, it's gonna be difficult to be part of it. First of all, uh, the requirement for the special mentoring that we're gonna do in 2015, it's gonna be, first of all, you're a tither. And you've gotta to tithe to this ministry because what I'll see is people who have, and this happens often, believe it or not, they tithe to another ministry and then want me to pastor them. That, that doesn't work. That's not, that's not righteous. All right? I understand the reasons why some people do that, and that's fine, but that's not, that's not the right way. I have an obligation to the people that are committed first, correct? Don't you have an obligation? Wouldn't you have an obligation to the people that are participating like that? Secondly, that's the easy part because you should do that anyway. A passion for the family mission. In other words, I'm not coming here to get another tool from my Batman tool belt. Some people do that. They, they see the churches as something that like a, 
like a tumbleweed. They just, they go that by much, uh, by much exposure, I will learn a great deal. Wrong. That's a tumbleweed. You grow by being planted and accountable, and nobody likes that because that's going to require self-governance, stability, and maturity. All right? So what I'm looking for in 2015 is there's going to be people that actually have a passion for the family mission, not just an agenda. What we do is we teach you how to die to your agenda so that God can resurrect destiny. I heard that in the, in the prophetic words this morning. Destiny always includes people. Success in the world can be selfish and carnal. You can walk over people and become a success. You can use people. You can use the church to think you're going to become a success. But in reality, real success is in the kingdom is basically people and investing in people, and your destiny will always include people. So what you need to be looking for is what by the Spirit, just like I recognized them long before they came, just from Internet comments, I felt a connection. And Cliff and Steen are from Massachusetts on our pastoral team. Jason from Kansas. Uh, Molly from Massachusetts and wherever, right? (laughs) Cape Cod. Uh, And what we saw, now Vicky's local, isn't she? Yeah, Vicky's local. She only lived with us for three years to get mentored. (laughs) Highly competent, all right? But what I'm saying is, is that this family mission means that I'm going to offer my time, my gifting, and my treasure to make it a two-way relationship because it's dysfunctional to have a one-way relationship with the gimme, gimme, gimme. See what I can get. You pastor, you've seen people do this before, huh? They come one time and somehow in their head, if they come one time, you're obligated to me. So I just drop everybody else and I give you my undivided attention because you came one time and honored me with your presence. All right. Visitors don't get nervous. This is, this is just something they say all the time. All right. Um, and they're going, oh, my God, I ain't never coming back here. <laughs> How many understand where I'm coming from, though? I want family. I want the real thing. I, want, I don't want AI. You know what AI is? AI means a heap of stones. A lot of churches are heaps of stones. And some people even hide from dealing with their stuff in a crowd. Big crowd, little crowd, doesn't matter. They can hide. I'm looking for a Bethel, a house of God, living stones that are being connected, like Jason said, in the bonds of peace, those supernatural connection, not man-made bonding. Man-made bonding is control and manipulation. Now, my legacy shouldn't be in buildings or projects. My legacy needs to be in people, and I'm thinking very seriously about my legacy. Uh, Jason's going to be preaching once a month, And that's my natural son. But what God is speaking to me is that he was a first fruit. God said, was it a couple years ago? Remember? I preached it before he came. That God says, I know uh, Hezekiah. I don't remember where it was. But it was basically God says, I'm restoring your firstborn. And in less than two months, we saw the kind of testimony. And we've been averaging two months on radical situations that the church pretty much gives up on or sweeps under the rug because they don't know what to do with it. I believe it's twofold. One, the 60-day challenge. It worked on Jennifer. It'll work on you. The other requirement for active mentoring between time, talent, and treasure. And by the way, when you, give, when you serve in a local body, you serve like uh, Rebecca does. She probably puts 15 hours a week minimum in here doing stuff that nobody else would pay attention to or know that it's done. But she's the one that's doing it. That's money. That's investment. Where your treasure is, that's where your heart is. So it's time, talent, and treasure. I believe Tom here is going to redo our studio, God willing, right? We're going to go with green screen instead of our other background. So we'll see how that works out in the days ahead. Um, But here's here's the requirement for this mentoring for 2015. Simple prayer, 60 day challenge. That 60 day challenge, that married couple in the back, they did it before they got married, and it paid off, didn't it? Hmm? After they got married, this is Catalina and Paul, they said after they were short, married a short time, they said, thank God we did that 60 days in advance. <laughs> did I say that wrong? <laughs> no, she said it's true. <laughs> it's true. I, we've had people call us that were newlyweds that were going to kill each other. 
and we gave them the 60-day challenge, and they, it worked so thoroughly that they said, we're not only going to do it for 60 days, we're going to do it another 60 days. And they just told me they're going to do it once every year, almost like a renewal of the vows, 60-day challenge. And the 60-day challenge doesn't pick on the other person. The 60-day challenge, you deal with your suitcase. You stay out of their suitcase. They're going to deal with their suitcase. But Jennifer studied under one of the greatest Bible college presidents and school psychologists, Christian counselor. She was mentored, and her mentor said, Jennifer will only get so far in life because she's so damaged. I don't know where you get that theology, but you, we don't have it here. Huh? She was going by her, her theology was being formed by her experience. And she saw that unless you're pretty emotionally balanced when you get saved, you're only going to go so far. That is just total nonsense. That's just, that's just pure. That's, that's forming your the. And this is a Bible school president. And this is basically because you formulated it based on your observation, not based on the Word of God or knowing how to help them properly. And I think the how-tos are going to be coming to the surface, if ever before. I want to teach people... We had a marketing expert once that was just blown away, he kept holding his head like this. He says, well, what do you do when you pray for somebody and they say this? I said, then you do this. What do you say when you do that? And I said, then you do this. What do you do then? Well, then you do this. Well, what do you say? Then you do that. You do that. And he goes, nobody's got a troubleshooting. Nobody even knows how to initiate the help with the trouble, yet alone a troubleshooting. We're going to teach that in the mentoring. But... The prerequisite is you did a 60-day challenge on your own and you're going to make yourself accountable because we had some people that said they did the 60-day challenge. They were with me for 10, 15 years. Found out they never did the 60-day challenge. What they did was they looked at that little three-minute video. We used to have a three-minute video clip. That's not the 60-day challenge. The 60-day challenge is you get in the presence of God, you get there and you center down and you, till you touch him. And, then, and until you touch him, you're not even praying. Praying, you have to meet him. Then when you meet him, you say, God, you search my heart. I'm feeling great today, but I'm looking for, I'm, I want you to just go for, I want intentional sanctification. I want to do like David in Psalm 19. I want you to search my heart for any secret sin, secret from me, secret sin that I might not create big blunders in my life. That's passion. And that's what mentoring is going to be about. Jennifer went from little much afraid when we first got married. She, her IQ is well above genius, well above genius. Daughter's IQ is well above genius. But we don't want to tell her that because she has a... <laughs> when we first met, when I met Jennifer, her daughter said, by the way, she's come for Thanksgiving. I hope she's not watching. She goes, she's checking me out. And uh, she was how old then? 13. Uh, she said, uh, I'll have you know that uh, I'm bored. Boredom is a sign of very intelligent people, you know. And I said, no, it's not. It's a sign of a lazy person that's not using the aptitude that God gave them. And then all of Jennifer's friends go, he'll be all right with her. <laughs> and I was. I drove her to school every day, and God says, after marrying Jennifer, there's your ministry. And she was a transformed young lady. Although she did want to learn my discernment, like Simon the sorcerer. Like she didn't really want to serve God that much, but she wanted that gift so she could use it on her friends. I'm like, no, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. But later she, she turned around. But anyway, in 60 days, less than 60 days, Jennifer was so transformed that those people back home didn't recognize her. They saw the transformation. And all she did, what we call the 60-day challenge, was she documented me teaching her. Because my peers said, Dennis, nobody can do it like you because you use discernment. And that, that, it just, it, no, not everybody has that. And so you can't do it. And she goes, I don't care what those pastors told you. You teach me. <laughs> and then she documented the way I taught her. And because I loved her, I wasn't afraid to deal with subjective stuff that's hard to explain. Drop down. And then she'd go, she wouldn't be saying nothing, and the room would fill with anxiety. And I go, Jennifer, what are you thinking? And she'd go, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do this and get the clothes more than I then get the car, and then we're gonna, we're gonna and I'm going, yeah. But that's what you're putting in the atmosphere. Without words, that's what's going in the atmosphere. Drop down. 
And then she documented it, and we have now what we call the 60-day challenge. I will not mentor anybody that has not gone through the 60-day challenge because it teaches self-governance, and bottom line, it's how to make Jesus Lord because I'm very concerned that that scripture that, that is, I'm reminded of on a regular basis, many will say in that day, Lord, Lord, did I not cast out devils? Did I not prophesy? And he'll say, depart from me, I knew you not. Because lawlessness is inherent in our society. And just because you're biblically literate, just because you can move in the gifts of the Spirit does not impress me. What impresses me is someone with self-governance. He who rules his spirit is greater than the mighty. And he who doesn't rule his spirit is like a city broken down without walls and the enemy can run it roughshod. Spiritual maturity requires as an absolute emotional maturity. I like to say spiritual maturity and emotional maturity are synonymous, but only that needs clarified. They're synonymous in the kingdom. I have seen unsaved people that were emotionally stable, but that didn't make them spiritual. But in the kingdom, you cannot be spiritually mature and emotionally unstable. That's a contradiction of terms. Because... The lordship of Jesus means let the peace of God rule. If peace isn't ruling and your toxic emotions are ruling, that is not spiritual maturity. And I've seen people all pumped up moving in in the prophetic, but down here they didn't even have peace. So I'm not impressed. But I am impressed if someone will go through the 60-day challenge, they can see radical life change. The next thing is that after the 60-day challenge... They've either already done it on their own or they're willing to do it with accountability. So newbies can get in on it, but you're going to be accountable to tell me, let me see your journal. What, you know, are you making any kind of progress? Uh, peace challenge with accountability. We'll lose some people on peace because it's the five-fold ministry of peace. We did that on Sid Ross and the people were kind of blown away because they hadn't dealt with the previous stuff. You try to then document how much peace you have in your life and you realize that the lack of peace in your life is a failure to have dealt with basic issues. What people say, I've been attacked by the devil, it's usually your own carnality that's beating you up. Because otherwise, why are people like Jennifer and I not under attack? Are we chopped liver? Are we that non-essential? Or have we learned to walk in a greater level of dominion where peace rules? It's a good question. There, oh, there is demonic warfare and there is pressure. But then we teach you how to resist both offensively and defensively as well. So every aspect of mentoring should have an active application in the life of the person being mentored, not just teaching. Mentoring to me is not just teaching. Mentoring is doing like uh, medical surgeons used to do. You see one, you do one, And then you teach one. We're going to use more of that model, which is actually more of a Hebrew model. See one, do one, teach one. And we saw people that were very comfortable receiving ministry, but very difficult to give ministry to somebody else. That's the unpacking of your potential. All right, but you, your legacy needs to be in people. My legacy is going to be in people. And the greatest act of a leader is fathering and mentoring Who are you training to take your place? If you suddenly died, would your ministry or business fall apart? So what is success? Success is a successor. I know Miles Monroe passed away, but I know his 40-year-old son is doing uh, the 29 and 30. Oh, I thought they were older than that. 29 and 30, a son and a daughter basically have the ministry going on. And that's how he basically traveled because he worked himself out of a job. Now, those are natural children. I'm saying spiritual children because I really believe that what what we are teaching could change the way church is done. It would bring an accelerator. Jim Gall used the expression, he was going to fly us up to Sanford's to get a father's blessing from them, from him. And that was right before Michael Ann died. And so I kind of put on hold. But basically, the attitude was, you and Jennifer have brought an acceleration to what others pioneered. Do you believe that God can do things faster than we've been done in the past? 
Martin Luther learned that you can get justification by faith. They were doing it the hard way, weren't they? Pentecostals, turn of the century, doing baptism of the Holy Spirit the hard way. There were Pentecostals that were Pentecostals for 20 years, waiting, if God wants me to get it, I'll get it. That was the... We have a tendency to make it harder than it is. We need to return to the simplicity that's in Christ and the Lordship. But the greatest act of a leader is fathering and mentoring. Who are you training to take your place? I believe there needs to be a Paul in your life. You need to know, you need somebody that, you, that can speak into your life. I know people are so afraid of authoritarianism, but I'm more afraid of what I see the, the new hippie movement where everyone does what is right in their own eyes because that reminds me of the book of Judges. Uh, whether we like it or not, God will always have leadership in the church, but these leaders should be coaches more than dictators. Coaches means I don't expect to play the whole game. I expect to equip you to do it better than me. Your legacy needs to be in people. True leaders make themselves unnecessary. They work themselves out of a job. We've said that for time. But great leaders, a great leader will be measured by their absence. I can remember even my first church, one of the best compliments I ever got was we had four worship teams, 40 signers, uh, children's with flags. Flag, we, we did all the equipping was inside the building. We're, we're not doing that as much now. All of the equipping was for inside the building. And an unsaved man walked in, and I was sitting in the front row. And he looked around, how does this all work? Because they didn't see a conductor. But they were that comfortable in their individual giftings. They knew when to get up and when to sit down. Uh, how many, uh, we had like 30 or 40 signers, but the, depending on what song came up there, they knew who went up, who went down. Flags, four different dance teams. Uh, all of that was basically organically grown out of who was there. And we still do it that way. We are basic, and what God has done in this planting was to be a prototype of what we did when we travel. And you know what it ends up turning out to be? God is sending us highly gifted people that need emotional work. Don't, don't look at the other person who goes, he's talking about you, he ain't talking about me. He, he must be talking about somebody else. Highly gifted people who do need the deeper character work, emotional healing, so that they can operate at the optimum of their gifts and their callings and get their acts together so that they go forward and upward and replicate. Now, if great leaders are measured by their greatness, isn't that, isn't that neat? That What did Jesus say? It is better that I go. Oh, there's, a, there's a nice anointing on it. Think about it. It's better that I go. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to have to learn to be that instrument on earth as it is in heaven. You're not going to be able to rely on my personhood. You're going to rely on relationship with me in me Christ in you the hope of glory and learning to be led by the spirit and know what is and what isn't right but the one out I have did the church grow by the way in Jesus' absence yeah. certainly did that's a sign of a great leader and he said if you've seen me you've seen the father there's a lack of a fatherly anointing might not be a lack of all mentoring, but there's a lack of fathers. Though you have 10,000 instructors, you don't have many fathers. And I'm really believing that leaders have to identify their successors, train them, equip them, and mentor them. And that's what I'm about. So you can't call up and say, can I have an appointment with Dennis from Topeka, Kansas? because it's probably not going to happen. Now, if you're a pastor or a leader and you're already working with people, that's a whole lot different, isn't it? There's somebody that's investing in people and, and I can make exceptions. But, but by and large, God says, your sons and your daughters are going to come from afar. They won't even know why or how they got here because I'm going to keep you in a place of obscurity until, until the fullness of time, whatever that is. That ought to narrow it down some. And if you're watching by Ustream because you didn't come to church today, we're talking to you too. It's going to require real commitment in 2015 for that. Consecrated accountability. You're going to forsake all known sin, confess your sin one to another, 
learn how to forgive and repent properly instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, and when it doesn't work. And so I believe that in the days ahead, it's going to be a matter of a revelation of the Father. There's been a revelation of the Holy Spirit. There's been a revelation of Jesus. I think the next revelation is going to be a revelation of the heart of the Father. And there's going to be the love of the Father, yes, but it's not going to be what I'm currently seeing in the kind of like Christian hippie movement where uh, God is the Father and he's all love and just tolerates all my sin. No, no. God is love. Love is not God. Love is not God when it contradicts righteousness, and that's the missing ingredient. So, Father, we just pray right now for today that you who began a good work are continuing that good work. This wasn't a sermon today more than it was a state of the season and the times that we're entering into. We're entering into a time of intense training and equipping, a time when, when people are gonna, that are passionate are going to hunger for more. And God is going to cause them to rise up in this day, rise up as sons and daughters. Jennifer, uh, tell us a little bit about that tecton before we close. The word um, tecton does not mean a worker with wood. It's uh, more of a stonemason uh, um, who builds, somebody who builds houses. And like Dennis was talking about, in the time of Jesus, it's not what is pictured in our Sunday school books and what you see on a lot of movies and shows that the promised land at that time had not been devastated and turned into desert. It was actually very lush and green and wealthy. And who in here saw the movie Ben-Hur? Do you remember Ben-Hur's house? It was a nice house. It was more after the Roman fashion. In the, in the cities and more um, urban areas, the Jewish people lived in nice houses with columns, with... Um, with courtyards, with pools, and they were not the little adobe places that we see in the pictures. And the building materials, they were imp a lot of the building material was imported, especially around the, um, the oceanfront areas, and limestone, marble, and natural stone. And so Joseph also was a tecton, and he would have had people who worked for him. He would have had artisans. He would have had laborers. He would have had people who could do fine finishing work in the houses he built. And so he was an entrepreneur. The, all the stuff about Jesus being a poor boy, you know, the little drummer boy, I'll play my drum for you. I'm a poor boy too. They had a family business. They were capitalists. And, um, and the, the, I knew the, she'd get that in right. there. Right, because, because capitalism, free enterprise, are biblical principles that came from the Bible. And then later employed after the time of Jesus in Europe in the monasteries, the Christian monasteries, before there was ever free enterprise in America. And so we had a family business here, a successful family business. By the way, Joseph and Mary had to go pay taxes. That was because they had an income they were making money and they had to pay taxes on the money that they were making. Now, in the, the way it worked in that time, uh, the extended families would live together in multiple houses a lot around an open area and they would build other, they, they were called insulae for extended family dwellings and the sons and the daughters would be part of the family business. More the sons than the daughters, but the whole family was involved in this. And Jesus would have been trained as the oldest son, the firstborn, to take over the family business. He would have learned finances. Remember, he talked often about the talents and investing and be careful how you uh, invest your money so that you will make a profit. And so he was raised up. Now, by the time we get to the New Testament account of Jesus as a grown man, 
he would have been the head of his family's business because Joseph was no longer there. So he would have been groomed and trained in being a wise master builder. When he talked about, be careful, a house must be built on a rock and not on sand, he knew what he was talking about. And everybody there in the time knew that he knew what he was talking about based on sound bu building principles. And so before he was ever placed in a position to be commissioned by his heavenly father to be a wise master builder, to build people into dwelling places of God in the spirit and corporate groups of con congregations into dwelling places of God in the spirit. He had first been a wise master builder in his earthly father's business before he was ever commissioned. And that's what he's in the business of right now is house building. Mm -hmm. You as a house, this is a house, and all over the world. And what we want to challenge those even watching by Ustream, that in the days ahead, what God has basically been speaking to us currently is that you have to be a son unto the father before you can be father unto sons. Lone rangers are not going to become fathers. I'm sorry, because you've never learned even what family is about. You have to be, a, Jesus himself had to be a son to the father before he could say, if you've seen me, you've seen the father before you can be fathers unto sons. And it's a missing element in, in our society because it sounds hard. But keep in mind that there's, I didn't like basic training in the military, but after I got out, I really was proud of the fact that I did it. We need that, you need that. You need to know that you're more capable than you think you are and that if someone's willing to pull the gold out, let them coach you and get that gold out. Let them teach you to stand on your own two feet and accomplish more than they ever accomplished. If you could find someone like that in your life, do you have someone that speaks into your life like that? Are you part of a crowd and nobody knows when you're hurt, nobody knows when you're bleeding? And uh, peer mentoring, uh, I have very little conference confidence in that. I know that's a, that's a procedure some people use, but I have no confidence in peer mentoring. I don't want boys raising boys. It's good to have friends. It's good to have peers. But there needs to be a structure of a, of, that's greater than that. So, Father, we just pray right now in the days ahead that, God, you who began a good work are going to continue that good work, and there are people that are going to reach their maximum potential in you as they pursue wholeness in their individual lives. They, in turn, are going to commit they are going to commit to help other people also. And to see other people is more important than themselves. In Jesus' name, amen. You've been listening to Pastor Dennis Clark and Dr. Jennifer Clark of Full Stature Ministries at Forgive123.com. Full Stature Ministries reserve all copyright protections under applicable law. Our copyright policy is available at our website, Forgive123.com. For more information about Full Stature Ministries and additional life-transforming materials, please visit Forgive123.com.